Okay, great. Um, so today we'll be talking about um, financing and economics in, um, in energy modeling and in transportation. Um, so some of this uh, theory you may have encountered in microecon, but hopefully this is going to be a little bit more applied to um, what you'll you'll typically see. Okay. So economics, um, which is really kind of the driver behind uh, the way our energy and transportation system is, is currently set up. Um, so all other sort of considerations equal. So if, if we don't really sort of take into account things like uh, environment and sustainability and, and that sort of thing, um, the ability for a particular project to be financed over an alternative is basically going to be driven by the costs of the project and, and sort of the economics over its, its lifetime. And so, um, you know, even if we do want to think about uh, a lot of these these other um, these other in, intangible things, or or you know, tangible but maybe not sort of based in 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 costs. Um, in like a totally free market. Uh, I think having a good grasp of this idea is really essential to, you know, really understanding why um, certain types of decisions are made in, in the way that they are. Um, so we're gonna be talking about things like discounting, net present value, future value, cash flows, um, analyzing costs, levelized costs, real nominal values. And then sort of at the end, we're gonna talk about um, this idea of social discounting and hyperbolic discounting, which becomes really relevant when we think about um, topics like climate change, which are really sort of intergenerational problems. And, and hopefully as we sort of go through all of the material in today's lecture, that'll be really clear why from an economic perspective, like climate change becomes a really sort of difficult problem to, to address. Um, okay, so, you know, the basic types of things that, that we can think about with uh, like energy economics, engine, um, economic engineering. Um, so, okay, if a wind turbine operates for 10 years, what's the cost of the electricity it produces? Uh, you can answer, uh, simple questions um, about thinking of, uh, of installing, you know, energy efficiency measures or energy generation measures. So in, in this case, like, well, does it make sense to install a solar hot water heater on, on your house? Um, and so all of these questions, we're going to kind of think about the foundation for how to address these uh, today. And then in future lectures, we're going to start to cover um how you can incorporate other uh other things such as uncertainty uh where you may not necessarily know you know uh, a particular outcome or forecast going out you know a decade or, or several decades in advance um so we we will talk about uh how uncertainty plays a role in this but but for today we're just gonna sort of talk about the the straightforward calculations of, of, of doing these, these sort of analyses. Um, okay, so really sort of quick um, highlight on a common misnomer. I see this all the time and uh, even like, I, I even see like researchers and faculty make, make this mistake. Um, which is, which is somewhat annoying. So make sure to get this, this right. Okay, so the cost versus price. Cost of energy uh, is the amount of money. Uh, so um, with, it, with regard specifically to energy, it's the amount of money we sell uh, energy to make a rate of return or, or profit on, on the investment. It's, it's basically um, the amount of money that it takes to actually produce the energy. Um, the price of energy is what that energy is sold for. And the reason why 
this is oftentimes conflated is because uh, in, in sort of like a theoretically perfect market, right? You, your costs are gonna equal your prices, but, but that's not always necessarily the case. And, and so the price of energy is gonna be determined by, by market forces um, and, and costs and price are, are not the same and they're not uh, really interchangeable. Okay, so just to, to make sure everyone's got that, that clear. Um, so the first concept we'll talk about today is inflation. Um, I'm sure most of you guys are pretty familiar with this concept, um, but essentially what this is, is uh, an increase in the cost of, of a good or service over time uh, and a decrease in purchasing power. Um, when you have inflation, the future amount of money doesn't have the same purchasing power uh, as money today. Um, and so if, if, we, if you think back, you know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, what are some common examples uh, of things that may have experienced inflation? Probably the one that goes to my mind uh, first is like, soda, right? So, so you used to be able to get like a can of soda for 50 cents and, and may, now it's maybe a dollar. Um, and so the, it's the exact same good, but the, uh, but because of inflation, um, the purchasing power of money uh, today is, is less than, than it would be, um, you know, 20 years ago. Uh, and, I, and I can't buy, right, the same amount of soda. Um, this equation here, uh, F naught equals F over one plus F to the N. This is a sort of thematic equation that we're gonna see a couple times today um, that expresses the change in value of, of money over time. And, and the F is specifically referring to in inflation rate in, in this case. Um, so es essentially, you know, if, if I were to look at this particular example, $100 in 1975 equals $426 today. Um, the, the calculation, right, for the inflation rate would be something like this. So your initial one is um, 100. So 100 is equal to uh 426 over one plus my inflation rate and then the n is the number of years so it would be 2020 um minus 1975 which is what 45 years so if i put 45 here you can solve for f to figure out what the inflation rate is so pretty straightforward um so what's a little bit more complicated about an inflation rate is that it's not, it's not actually like some uniform rate for all sort of goods and services, right? You can imagine that in the example that I just gave, um, the inflation in, uh, in the price of a can of soda uh, may be different than the inflation that you might see in uh, for like a gallon of, of gasoline or something like that. Um, and so the question becomes, how do you actually go about figuring out sort of a, a, an inflation rate that, that you can use? Um, and so the way that it's commonly done is calculated using a, what's known as a consumer price index. Um, so you may have heard of this before. Um, it measures an average change uh, over time in the consumer's cost of living. And that cost of living is represented by um, what's known as sort of quote unquote, a, a basket of goods. Um, and so that basket of goods is like a, a, a set of goods and services and, and products that are commonly bought by consumers and they track uh the prices of of the things in that basket over time and sort of average it out to figure out this this index which is 
a representation of like average inflation for sort of the average consumer. Um, and so of course, like if you really sort of dive into this issue, um, there, are, there, there are some problems associated with this particular basket of goods because you, know, you can imagine that the types of goods and services that I buy uh, now are probably different than the goods and services that I bought 10 or 20 or 30 years ago. Um, so the composition of the basket itself can be uh, somewhat debatable. Um, but okay, we're getting a little bit into the weeds here. For the most part, the CPI, the Consumer Price Index, is kind of fairly agreed to be a nice representation of, of the inflation rate. And, and all of that sort of explanation is, is just to make sure that you guys understand where it's coming from and that, and that it's not necessarily sort of a perfect representation. Uh, and, and oftentimes, if you're really getting into the nitty gritty details of like a particular uh, um, commodity or, or good or, or service, um, sometimes you, you don't use the CPI because you, you may have like a better representation of inflation for that particular, uh, particular thing. Um, the CPI is uh, tracked by um, the BLS, which is the uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics, I think. Um, yeah, and so you can you can use this website uh, to to look up these values. Um, okay, and so the concept of inflation can be applied to um, this idea of a constant versus a current dollar. Uh, so a constant dollar uh, includes the effect of inflation and a current dollar um, attempts to adjust for the effect of inflation so that everything is expressed in a way that can be sort of equivalently thought of in, in the same uh, sort of base year. Um, and so if I think about the, the cost of a particular um, uh, good or service, or sorry, the, the price of a, of, a, of a good or service, um, when you have it in constant dollars, uh, say I, I travel back in time to 1990 uh, and, I, and I purchase a gallon of gasoline. So the amount of money that it, that it took me to buy that gallon uh, in that year is the constant uh, dollar. But if I were to sort of equivalently take that money and see how much um, uh, it, it, would, it, would, it would cost now, right? So that, that current dollar the, is, is then adjusting for the effect of these 30 years of inflation. So to, to give you an example of, of what that looks like, um, this is in the, in the top uh, sort of gray line is inflation, adjusted for inflation. So current dollars uh, tied to uh, the year 2012. And then in the black line below is the price that you would actually pay in that year. And so if I were to go back to my example, and look at 1990, you know, I would pay $1.50 for a gallon of gasoline then, but really the sort of value of that money today when I adjust for inflation is actually closer to, you know, $2.60. So even though, you know, you say back in the 80s, it only cost me a dollar to buy a, a gallon of gasoline, well, compared to sort of today's dollar and, and the worth of that money because of inflation, it's actually closer to three dollars. So you know that that's actually not so different from uh, the price of, of gasoline in, in 2012. Um, and so you guys can see, hopefully, really clearly here that you know inflation really uh, increases uh, over long periods of time. Um, so it's important to kind of think about this effect uh, when, when you're thinking about um, 
prices or costs of items uh, many years in, in the past or, or even many years in, in the future. Okay. Uh, next concept is interest rates. So uh, interest rate is essentially uh, the cost of borrowing money. So when a lender loans money to the borrower, that lender expects to have some kind of return. Otherwise, you know, why would I lend you my money? Um, and that rate is typically proportional to the amount um, uh, of, of the loan. And interest rates can vary very dramatically. Um, so you can think of kind of the, one of the ones that really acts as a driving force for setting interest rates in, in a lot of other sort of um, types of loans is, is the federal interest rate which basically is the government saying, okay, uh, to, to the central bank, I want you to loan money at this specific interest rate. And so if, if for example, I want to really try and stimulate the economy uh, and I'm the federal government, I may try and lower the interest rate, which means that uh, it becomes cheaper to borrow money and uh, it causes people to essentially spend more or buy more things, right? And, and so that's one of these central tenants in, in, in uh, getting sort of the populace to, to essentially spend more money um, in order to stimulate the, the economy. Um, so rates can vary according to the currency of the principal sum. And so you can imagine that like, uh, if, I, if I lend you $1 versus a million dollars, right? The, the amount of money I expect to, to charge you via these interest rates could uh, be different. Um, and that has to do with the fact that, okay, maybe I consider the $1 million loan to be riskier than loaning you a dollar, and therefore I want a higher rate uh, in order to sort of uh, alleviate that risk. Um, term to maturity of the investment. Uh, so if I want you to pay me back in uh, in one day versus in, in 10 years, you can imagine also the interest rate could, could differ, um, the perceived risk of the transaction. So those are kind of related to, to those, those things, but, but also like you can, you can imagine that if, if, I, if I don't think that you're gonna pay me back or, or there's a higher likelihood that you're not gonna pay me back, then I may charge a, a different interest rate. Um, and so this is tied to things like credit scores, right? So if you have, a really good credit score, then you are more trustworthy in returning the money. And so you may get better interest rates. Uh, in, in other words, the lower interest rates. And then sort of supply and de demand in the market, which is, which is just to say there are lots of like market forces that could in influence the way um, interest rates are, are, are happening. So like uh, if, the housing market were to suddenly collapse, right? The, then mortgage loans and the interest associated with lending people money to, to buy houses is probably gonna change in, in some way. Um, so this equation here is really sort of related to um, the, the one from before, uh, but essentially the interest the amount that you have to pay based on the principal is equal to the amount that's being loaned times the rate times the number of uh, payback periods that there are. Um, and that gives sort of the total amount uh, that needs to be returned. Okay. 
most powerful force in the world is compound interest. Uh, so this is a pretty uh, interesting concept. This is um, when you when you lend or or borrow money and you are expected to sort of pay back, then uh, that interest will compound on itself, uh, which means that. Um, if you are, if you are, for example, making interest off an investment and you put in some amount of money to begin with, the amount of interest that you get every year is going to continue to increase, right? Because um, the 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 amount that you're loaning essentially is is increasing until you sort of get that money back. Um, and so this is kind of my uh, spiel to uh to get you guys to to think about um saving for retirement uh so if you if you were to kind of put in uh money annually into like in a retirement account really the sort of payback starts to ramp up uh, the longer and longer that you keep the money in there because of, um, because of compound interest. And so if you start, uh, if you start when you're say 20 years old, right, with the same uh, annuity, you can get um, essentially close to double what you would get if you were starting 10 years later, which, which is really kind of to drive home the point that that's uh, that the power of compound interest is that uh, really that the longer that you kind of keep your investment going, then um, the, the sort of larger it grows uh, at, at the sort of end period. Uh, so yeah, if you wanna be uh, an quote unquote easy millionaire by the time you're 65, then um, uh, start your <laughs> retirement plans early. Um, okay, so all of these things about um, kind of money uh, changing in value over, over time, right, having to do with either inflation or having to do with um, the, the sort of the value associated with, with borrowing or loaning money, um, it is often sort of conflated, but, but it is related to this, uh, I think, more uh, central premise of discounting, which is the preference between the value of consumption today and consumption in the future. Um, okay, and so let's think about, um, let's think about discount rates. Uh, so, so, th so they're not the same as an inflation rate or an interest rate. Um, it is essentially the time rate of change of money. And so I'm going to give a nice sort of example of, of this. Um, and, and, and so while discount rate is not equal to these things, they definitely are influenced by things like inflation and, and interest rate. Um, and so we'll come back to this equation in, in just a second. But in the meantime, I need a, a volunteer. So who wants to, to, to speak up for this next, next part of our, our chat? Anyone? Bueller? I can jump in. All right, uh, Daniel. Yes, sir. So, um, let me ask you a question. Uh, if I were to give you a thousand dollars, would you rather me give you a thousand dollars today or a thousand dollars tomorrow? <laughs> uh, you can be, you know, be frank. What? Yeah, I would think uh, uh, I'd say today. Okay. Okay. Let me make it easier on you. Let's say a thousand dollars today, or a thousand dollars one year from now. 
uh, today. Today, okay, and, and, and why is that? Um, because if it's extra money that I don't have any use for, I can just sock it away. Yeah, and yeah, you could, you could, right? You could take that thousand dollars and you could stick it in a bank for a year. And you could make a measly, what is, what is it these days, like 0.01% interest. Right. So you could make like a sweet, you know, extra dollar. <laughs> uh, and, and then in one year, you would have $1,001 compared to $1,000. So, so yeah, you actually make more money if you, if you take it today, right? Because you could do stuff with that $1,000 now that maybe uh, that, uh, that is worth more than having to sort of wait and, and, and do it like you could instead of putting it in a bank you could put it in like some stocks that that could gain you like five percent right right okay so uh and so the value of this thousand dollars is different for you today versus one year from now so let me ask you what if i were to say one thousand dollars today or a thousand and let's say $1,001 one year from now, what, what would you pick? Um, I'd still probably take it today. Okay, okay. How about $1,000 today versus $1,010 next year? Um, I'd still take 1,000 today. Okay, uh, how about $1,050? Now you're getting closer. I think you'd have to hit 1,100 for me to like- Okay. All right, so eleven hundred dollars is when you're saying it's about. Okay, so now I think that's what I would be like. All right, I'll just wait. Yeah, sure, sure, fair enough. And and so let's figure out your discount rate. So we can we can go back and look at this equation here and look at the quantity of money uh, in some future year uh, C versus the present value. So if I were to say one thousand dollars today. Um, versus $1,100 in the future divided by one plus your personal discount rate uh, for one year, then I can go ahead and solve this equation, which would be, uh, what would it be? So uh, 1,100 divided by 1,000 uh, is equal to um, 1.1, which is equal to one plus I. So your personal discount rate for this particular problem is 10%. Um, okay. Uh, that's actually kind of a high dis discount rate for, for an individual, but, but well within sort of reasonable ranges. Um, and so this is one, this is essentially the way that we can actually go about like eliciting individual discount rates. Uh, we, can, we can basically figure out, oh, how much money are they willing to take now versus in the future? And, and you can imagine that like discount rates can vary wildly between people and they can also differ wildly in, in um, depending on the context of, of the problem. Because, you know, I might, what if I change this to like a dollar versus a dollar and 10 cents? Right. Theoretically, Daniel would be saying, oh, I would rather take, or, or it'd be equal to take a, a one dollar and ten cents, right? But but the quantity of money can actually make a difference, right? And and so if it were like a million dollars versus uh, a million and a hundred thousand dollars, you know, that that uh, he, maybe the discount rate would be lower. And and he would say, I'd be willing to take a million and you know, twenty thousand dollars instead of a million and a hundred thousand um, dollars in the next year. So, so context really does matter for for these types of things. Um, so, when we think about, oops, let me clear this. So, when we think about what discount rate should be used, um, there isn't really a sort of generally correct answer. And so, you know, in in the homeworks and in uh, like projects and, and even in kind of scientific research studies and stuff like that, people will just pick these discount rates um, and, and, and sort of assume that that is the reasonable rate for you know, a particular 
uh, type of activity. And, 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 you know, oftentimes we just kind of brush through it and think that's fine. But, but, but always keep in mind that like discount rates can, can vary quite a bit. Um, so the types of values that you're going to see in, uh, in, in like real scientific studies and, and economic sort of analyses uh, often are kind of in these order of magnitude. So, so businesses oftentimes have much higher discount rates than an individual. And that's because um, when, when I think about like what the discount rate really represents, it, it is my opportunity to like make some return on, on that money. So I gave the example of, you know, sticking it in into a bank or investing it in some stock. Um, and businesses oftentimes have a greater ability to invest the money or do something with the money than an individual does. And for that reason, they end up having higher discount rates. So they won't take on like a project unless you're guaranteed to make a higher rate of return because they know they have other sort of opportunities that they can do with that money. So very often we're gonna see things like 10 to 15% discount rates for, for businesses. Um, essentially, um, uh, you're, you're willing to, to take on sort of higher risk with higher discount rates. Um, individual discount rates are usually vary between one to 5%. Although, you know, in cer certain contexts, in, in some cases, you'll see things like, like Daniel was demonstrating as high as, as 10% for, for individuals. But, but generally, I think most people use like 5%-ish as, as a representation for like an individual a person's discount rate. Um, okay. So having sort of kept all of this in mind, let's think about this um, uh, compounding future value method. Um, okay, so let's say you have an option of buying uh, a painting for $10,000 uh, and you know that in one year from now, uh, it's definitely gonna be worth uh, $11,000. So we need to consider the opportunity cost. Um, so the, the way that I kind of like to approach these problems, actually the way that I was taught in, in grad school is to make these uh, diagrams of streams of benefits and, and costs over, over time. And, and so I'll, I'll, I'll try and stick to that um, for future examples. Um, let's say, uh, if you were to put the $10,000 savings, uh, you could earn an a simple interest of 8%. Um, and the question is, sort of would you, would you buy that painting? Um, and, and if these were your only two options, right, then it would make sense to, to buy the painting because what you're gonna be making uh, back from that uh, opportunity is greater than your alternative opportunity. Uh, so the answer to this question, it's okay, it's, it's this particular problem is maybe intuitively obvious, um, but the principle behind this uh, is that you should always choose the option that maximizes uh, net benefits. Um, make sure that you are, are using uh, values uh, adjusted to the same time value of money. So let me go back to this slide. So um, you have this $11,000 versus this $10,800. And those are both expressed as the value that you're, uh, or the currency that you're getting one year from now. So they can be sort of directly compared. Um, so, so this particular example is called future value, where we compound our current value into the future, right? We're multiplying by um, that interest rate and then figuring out how much you get at, at the end. 
you can also do what's known as a present value, which is doing this problem in reverse. So how much money would you actually need to invest at that 8% level to get $11,000 in one year? Um, and so with future value of money, uh, it was like this, FB, right, is equal to PV times one plus I, which is, um, you know, 10,800 is equal to my present value, 10,000 times 1.08 um, to the power of one, since N is one. Um, yeah, so the more generic version of this would be N here. Uh, we can also go backwards and see um, how much money I would have needed to start with. And so the present value of having the $11,000 option, uh, you can just change the equation from here to here. Um, and you'd end up with uh, this present value, which is greater than your initial value. So you, you choose that option. It, it has essentially a lower investment cost. Okay. Um, and then the last one is the net present value method. Um, so you can think of this as these um, funding streams where I can draw this little diagram. And so this is what I was talking about earlier, where you have these dots representing points in time. Uh, and then flows of money. So if you make an investment, uh, it's negative here. So this is negative $10,000. Uh, and this is um, a positive $11,000. Um, every time you uh, do an application of a year, uh, you have to do the discount rate associated with that. And so this would be, um, the net present value would be uh, negative 11,000, oops, sorry, negative 10,000 plus uh, 11,000 divided by one plus 0 0.08 to the first power, um, which is equal to negative 10,000 minus or plus uh, 10185. Um, so your net present value is $185. So it's NPV positive. Um, and you can sort of decide to, to buy the PT. Okay, and, and we'll show an example of this in a moment, sort of applied to the, the types of energy problems that, that we'll be thinking about. Um, but in general, these are your sort of basic options. Uh, present value, future value, net, net present value. Um, yeah, and, and so you, you may again recognize this particular type of equation from, from earlier. It's the same thing as when we're thinking about um, when, when we are thinking about the, the inflation term. Um, think about this more as, as a concept um, rather than memorizing the equations. Uh, I've oftentimes had students who, because of the, the structure of the formula, it's, uh, it looks identical if we're talking about inflation versus discounting um, versus interest rates. Uh, but you just need to remember the concept of what each of those rates are doing to money today versus in the future. So uh, the best way that I like to think about this is like, um, if I have like a discount rate and a value today, and you're thinking about future value and you're trying to figure out, oh, do I multiply it? Do I divide it? Well, in, in a present value, uh, the value of the money for when I'm discounting it in the future is always going to be lower 
and so I'm dividing it, right? And with interest, if you're doing like an investment, the value of the money is going to increase in the future, and so you, you multiply. And so rather than sort of directly memorizing each of these, these terms for the different rates, just remember if, if the value of the money decreases in the future, you divide, and if it increases in the future, then, then you multiply. Okay. Um, most uh, of energy modeling, so if we think about investment of a particular um, like power producing, if I, or if I wanted to talk about investment in like a power plant, um, you want to minimize the NPV of the total system costs. Um, and so when I think about what this term is doing here, um, which is your discounting for costs for this particular project in, in the future, um, then it becomes intuitive that when you have a really high discount rate, uh, then you wanna favor projects that have lots of costs in the future. And that's because when when you discount those costs, they, they will decrease more. Um, and so you like to have things that are amortized over long, long periods of time. Whereas when you have low discount rates, um, you want to favor things that have most of the costs up, up front. So really sort of, sort of the opposite. Um, other, other sort of common economic terms to, to keep in mind. So there's something known as the internal rate of turn. Um, this is more common in sort of like business and financing when we think about how long it essentially takes to uh, get a payback where you are actually thinking about the time value of money. And so uh, what rate would you need to set in order to have an NPV uh, of zero? Um, so you can imagine that uh, at a really low discount rate, um, then the costs from some revenue stream may make the payback period a really sort of long time uh, compared to sort of your upfront costs. And then if you crank up that discount rate um, or whatever rate that you're using, uh, that's going to start decreasing the uh, the cost of the projects that that are amortized over time, um, and so as you go from one end of the spectrum to the other, at some point you're going to be able to get the NPV to um, to equal zero, uh, and it's a nice sort of way for businesses to do a comparison across a variety of investment activities. Um, because you can figure out uh, the, so essentially what this means is that with a higher internal rate of return, the more profitable the project or less risky the project because it, it means that it doesn't take as long essentially to, to sort of um, pay back. Um, and that is somewhat related to um, this last uh, piece here, which is a payback period. Uh, this is the period of time during which um, you recoup your expenditures. And so if you make an investment in like a power plant, right, it costs a bunch of money up front, but then you'll slowly be making back money by selling electricity that you're producing from the power plant. And so the question is, how long does it take me to make that money back? Um, and the answer is not, this sort of straightforward thing where like, if I make X dollars per year, I could just divide by the, the capital cost, right? Because of the time value of money, which gets, makes these problems uh, slightly more complicated. Um, I mean, if you're familiar with, with this concept and the equations, then it's not you know, so difficult to, to calculate this, but it, it's, it is not so straightforward as just dividing the sort of uh, revenues that you're getting per, per year. 
Um, so with a discounted payback period, which is what I'm talking about, um, you are doing a discount on the total annual operating costs every year. Um, and in terms of like making investments, uh, you know, again, uh, the payback period is going to differ um, or, or an acceptable payback period is going to differ depending on if you're an individual or if you're a business or you, if you have lots of money or not so much money. Um, uh, different sort of series of surveys um, have found that payback periods um, are usually acceptable uh, between a year to three years. So this is really generalized, right? Um, and, and most businesses, again, will prefer to have lower payback periods um, uh, because they can, um, they, they, they have other opportunities for investments, although that it, it's caveated, right, by the fact that they have a lot more capital. And so depending on the context of the problem, you know, they, they may actually take, accept longer pay, payback periods than um, would be tolerated by, by like an individual. So it kind of goes both ways there. Um, so I'm gonna show this one last slide before we take a quick break. Um, so this is a, kind of a slide that's showing essentially a shortcut um, for a, lots, a lot of typical types of problems that we see in, in engineering economics. Um, so there's a little shortcut to do with annuities. Um, if, if I were to go back to, uh, to my sort of example uh, of this diagram where I have year zero, year one, year two, and so on and so forth to say, you know, maybe we have, oops, um, maybe we have something like going all the way out to like 40 years. Um, so the way that this works, let's say this is, you know, negative 100, negative $50, negative $75. Uh, if I were to sort of calculate the NPV manually, then it would be something like, uh, okay, let's say let's say we have a discount rate of uh, 0.1. So it would be negative 100 minus 50 divided by 1.1 to the first power minus 75 times 1.1 to the second power minus 80 divided by 1.1 to the third power and so on and so forth. Um, and so it's, it's kind of a pain to, to calculate this. You can do it in a spreadsheet pretty easily, I guess. But um, if you have uh, a type of problem where the amount, the, the flows are the same every year, then you can use this annuity shortcut. So let's say these are all, um, Let's say these are all negative 100 every year. Instead of going through that whole process, there is this nice little shortcut for, um, for annuities where you get the same amount every year. Um, if you simplify this, you end up getting to this equation here. And so what I was showing before is going to end up being so like, so this whole deal is going to be and so on and so forth all the way to 40 years is going to be the same value uh, as 100 times 1 minus 1.1 to the negative 40 divided by 0.1. Uh, it's just a mathematical simpl simplification of of, uh, of this whole string of, of processes. Um, and that comes in handy because a lot of times the types of um, problems uh, are, are kind of simplified so that you do end up with 
uh, these, these sort of annuities. Um, okay, so let's take a quick break here for five minutes and um, yeah, and I'll, and I'll answer questions if, if anyone has any in the meantime. Okay, let's get back to it. So um, I have shown you guys a chart uh, like this 
uh, in, in a previous lecture. Um, and so this is what is known as the levelized cost of energy. Um, and so again, this is one kind of way that people have attempted to be able to directly compare costs between different um, power production technologies. Um, and so let's dive into what this exactly sort of represents. So the levelized cost of energy. Um, okay, so you've got this like really, I guess, com somewhat complicated formula here, uh, but but we're going to break this down uh, in in uh, hopefully a pretty straightforward way that that again is building off of um, what I've what I've already shown you. But essentially, you you're taking the total cost of of everything that goes into into this over its lifetime. So you got to build the plants, uh, and that's got a bunch of upfront costs associated with it. Um, and then uh, you've got to pay for the fuel, and you got to pay for operations and maintenance, uh, and and all of that stuff that happens sort of later down the line has to get uh, discounted, right? Which is why you have this sort of one plus R value um, dividing your sort of future. Uh, money streams. So you take all of that cost in this numerator and then you divide it by the total amount of energy that that power plant produced. Uh, and so at the end of the day, it's like you've got the lifetime cost divided by um, the lifetime energy production. Um, and so let's, let's take an example. Uh, uh, of two different um, generators uh, and, and go ahead and, and show how we do this calculation, right? Um, okay, so you've got, uh, let's, let's look at a uh, rooftop solar PV system. Uh, okay, it's 100 kilowatts, so this is a really big rooftop. So this might be something that you would find on uh, like a really big, like shopping mall building or, or like a really big parking garage. Um, so hundred kilowatts, it's going to cost a hundred thousand dollars to build. So that's about a thousand dollars, that a thousand dollars per kilowatt or, um, something like a dollar per megawatt, which is, um, kind of on the lower end for solar, but, but sort of with, well, within reason, uh, let's say the maintenance of this thing is about $3,000 per year. It's got no fuel costs. Uh, the estimated annual production of a hundred kilowatt system is uh, 182,500 kilowatt hours. Um, okay, so real quick aside, uh, what's the, um, what is the capacity factor of this thing? If there's, uh, let's see if there's 8,760 hours in uh, a year. So then you've got 182,500 divided by 8,760 plus two zeros, one, two. Um, what is that? 18 over 87. So this particular example, the capacity factor of this solar plant would be uh about 20 percent a little higher than 20 percent um which is fairly sort of average for for uh solar plants in in decent places like california okay uh the project lifetime is 25 years and a discount rate of 15 percent um so the thing that uh, to, to really keep in mind here is that you've got a capital cost of a hundred thousand and uh, $3,000 per year, uh, you've got a 25 year lifetime and a 15% discount rate. So let's, let's put all of this together. Uh, and I'm gonna use the exact same technique that I've been showing. Again, I think this is a nice sort of visual way of, of seeing what's going on. Um, and then we'll go dot, dot, dot out to year 25. 
right? Which is how many, um, that, that's the lifetime of this particular asset. Uh, and we have a discount rate of uh, 0.15. So in year zero, we have a really big sort of negative. So this is $100,000 to uh, essentially construct this thing overnight. Uh, and then every subsequent year, we have a $3,000 uh, cost for maintenance, um, but we don't actually have any fuel costs. So it's, it's actually fairly straightforward. Um, so these are all $3,000 and so on and so forth, all the way out to year 25. Okay. Um, and one of the things that we'll note here, right, is that these annual costs are all the same. And so we can lean on that annuity equation, which is equal to P equals A one minus uh, one plus I to the negative N. This is unfortunately one of the ones that you end up just sort of having to memorize. Um, and then the last thing to remember is that uh, we generate 182,500 kilowatt hours per year. So, um, the levelized cost of energy is just equal to uh, adding up the total costs. Let me let me highlight that in red. So my total costs, uh, and then um, dividing it by the total amount of energy that's produced over its lifetime. So let's do the costs first. So the first one, it's going to be 100,000 uh, plus 3,000 divided by 1.15 to the first power plus 3,000 divided by 1.15 squared plus 3,000 over 1.15 five cubed and so on and so forth all the way until we get to year 25. Uh, and then this quantity is gonna get divided by 182,500 kilowatts per year times uh, 25 years. And again, I can simplify this with my annuity equation. So it'll be 100,000 plus 3,000 times one minus 1.15 to the negative 25 divided by 0.15. All of this over, uh, this ends up being 4562.5 megawatt hours. Uh, and if I solve for this, you end up with, uh, twenty six point one seven dollars per megawatt hour. Okay, and so that is kind of the calculation for doing the levelized cost of energy um, for solar. Uh, so we will keep this number in mind. And remember, again, the whole point of doing a levelized cost is so that I can do some kind of comparison. Uh, and in this case, um, that comparison will be against this coal power plant. And let's take a look at what the levelized cost of electricity is for, for this coal power plant. Um, oh, okay, wait, I'll give you a little bit longer to look at this. So again, the thing that we need to keep in mind, so the capital cost is $2 billion, is a lot higher, right? We're talking about this 600 megawatt plant. Um, the maintenance uh, is now per megawatt hour produced. Um, and then there's a fuel cost for uh, per megawatt hour produced as well. And you've got an estimated annual production of about 3 million megawatt hours. Uh, 
the lifetime is a little bit longer and then we have the same discount rate. Um, so this is like a way that I could compare in theory, like a rooftop solar PV system to an entire coal plant on the basis of uh, electric on, on, on the basis of like levelizing the costs in the same way. So I can see how much it costs to produce like a marginal unit of, of electricity. And again, this is kind of a silly comparison because you wouldn't necessarily want to do a comparison of a rooftop system against like a full power plant, but, but this is the application that, that you can do to levelize costs across different um, power assets. Okay, so it's gonna be the same principle here, just to be consistent, year zero, year one, year two, so on and so forth, all the way out to year 40. The co initial cost is gonna be $2 billion. Uh, and then every year, we're gonna do um, the cost of the fuel and the maintenance, which is now a function of the power production. So we produced 3153, 600 megawatt hours. Uh, and this has to get multiplied against uh, the cost for maintenance, which is $2 per megawatt hour and uh, $25 per megawatt hour for the fuel. Um, so let me just do it like this to be extra clear. Um, so this is going to be equal to, let me see, 85,147,200. Okay, so we have this annual value, which is gonna get repeated for every year out until year 40. Oops, so 147,200. Okay, and so if I wanna do the levelized costs of energy, then it would be, right, my $2 billion, lots of zeros, plus my annuity. Again, I'm gonna use that shortcut equation because in this case, all of the annual amounts are the same. So this is 8514700 times uh, one minus 1.15 to the, oops, to the negative 40 divided by 0.15. And all of this quantity is divided by my 3153600 three, megawatt hours time or per year times 40 years. And if I solve for this, I end up with approximately 20.34 per megawatt hour. Um, okay, so if I were to uh, compare these two, two items, so this is coal, and then you've got uh, our number from before, 26.17 per megawatt hour. This is my solar value. So now I can quote unquote sort of directly compare the difference between uh, these really sort of different systems in a kind of standardized way. Okay. Any questions about levelized costs? No, okay. Um, so even though these systems are really different, 
uh, levelized costs again are a nice sort of way of getting to be able to compare them apples to apples. Uh, I do want to quickly mention some more thoughts about levelized cost of energy. Again, this is a, a fairly sort of common way uh, people do these comparisons in, in the scientific community, but of course there are some controversies about it. It's, it's not a perfect metric by, by any means. Um, and some of the arguments about why uh, you, the economics of comparing conventional types of generators to renewable technologies is, is flawed. Um, it, it doesn't take into account, right, the way that we do it, um, it doesn't take in, into account the value of the electricity that's, that's being supplied. And so uh, even though like we as residential consumers often pay like flat rates or tiered rates, um, the cost of electricity can change quite a bit uh, over the course of a day and, and across sort of you know different seasons in, in the year. And, and that's because there's this whole, this is going back to the concept of, of dispatch of electric power generators, um, depending on, on what's being turned on and what's being turned off, um, uh, the value of electricity is gonna be different. And that's not something that the uh, LCOE can, can capture uh, in, in a really straightforward way. Um, and then certain types of generators that can balance supply and demand at, at certain times, like, like when you really need the electricity, uh, they should in theory have a greater sort of economic advantage. Uh, again, so going back to this idea of the value of electricity being different over different times of the day, different periods of time, that's not something that the levelized cost of energy is, is able to capture in, in this sort of uh, approach. Um, so there, there are other sort of frameworks um, for doing these types of comparisons that, that uh, folks will use. Um, and, and we're not gonna delve into those. Oftentimes they're highly detailed and specific to particular technologies. Um, but the, the reason why you know, we're showing this concept is, is because it is fairly accepted and, um, and you're gonna see it, uh, especially if you're you know, working in, in certain uh, fields in, in energy or transportation, it, it, it is a, a fairly common metric. So it's important to understand you know, both, both how to derive that value, but, but also understand some of the, the drawbacks of using these levelized costs. Um, okay. Let's talk about uh, a specific sort of concept related to discount rates. And, and this is where we're gonna start talking about um, sort of broader scale issues uh, linked to discounting. There is uh, something known as a hurdle rate for a technology. Um, and that is where we observe, essentially where we observe these really sort of high discount rates for demand technologies. Um, so, they're not entirely, now, I don't, so I, I, I don't wanna sort of um, mislead you guys when, when thinking about hurdle rates as like something intrinsic to the technology that is causing it to be valued less. Oftentimes they're like weird things with consumer behavior. Um, and we end up assigning discount rates that are really kind of wacky and, and really high because that's, what we kind of end up observing. So a nice example of this is with light bulbs. Okay, so even as near as 10 years ago, um, the sort of most common uh, lighting uh, that, that you would see um, was an incandescent light bulb. And, you know, think about an incandescent light bulb compared to an LED today. Um, they are, way, way, way less efficient. And by like less efficient, I mean like 90% less efficient, right? It, it's crazy how 
really kind of terrible the technology as compared to to a lot of what what we see today. Um, and and yes, like LEDs and CFLs were definitely a little bit more expensive and, and pricey back then. But if you did like really rudimentary math, like the payback time on on something as simple as a light bulb was incredibly fast. Like you would make your money back based off the energy savings alone, and the light light bulbs themselves would last like many times longer than an incandescent light bulb. But the fact is that if you went and looked at the data and see how people were buying light bulbs, you would find that uh, that that LEDs and CFLs would have what we would call incredibly high discount rates because you're relying on the payback and energy to, to make your money back from the higher sort of upfront purchases. And they, they were at these rates that um, that kind of didn't really make sense. I, you know, if you're talking about 30% discount rates and you can get paybacks in like a year or two, um, that that's, that probably has something to do with perception and consumer behavior and, and that sort of thing. Right. And so that's, that's what's driving sometimes a lot of these crazy discount rates. Um, so, so you can have these tech, these these hurdles to adopting technology um, that that can sometimes be driven by the attributes of the technology themselves, but uh, but a lot of times can also be driven by like consumer preferences and behaviors. Um, and so there are a lot of these studies that kind of look at um, uh, energy appliances uh, and and looking at energy efficiency investments. Um, that uh, rep that 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 lead to these efficiency gaps that that we are saying are because of these hurdles. Um, oh, okay. So I see a question. So de demand technologies. Uh, I I just mean like uh, any. Well, well. So in this particular context, like um, energy consumption and products. So like things like light bulbs or like vehicles. Uh, really sort of any uh, any sort of new technology that, that you would end up using. Um, so again, these hurdle rates uh, with high implicit discount rates are oftentimes due to like market failures, imperfect information, a lot of these like classical like economic uh, issues. Um, and Things that have these crazy discount rates oftentimes are like almost like low hanging fruit because it, it really means that um, that if you lower the discount rate, it, it suddenly becomes really appealing, right? Because uh, it would take a high discount rate for you not to choose to use that technology or invest in that particular uh, uh, item. And so if you can solve some of these issues, um, then that's that's a nice way of sort of getting over your, your technology hurdle rate. Um, okay, and so there's sort of one, I, I almost think of this as like a backwards uh, uh, concept of, of discounting where we, where we sort of, Define the discount rate to be really high because of there are the, there are these other these other issues. Um, but I want to talk about uh, time preference and, and time discounting and, and sort of more fundamental, broader uh, like concept. Um, okay, so we've we've already sort of gone over the basics of discounting, right? So people value present more than future. Um, how much is money worth today versus later. And, and so hopefully I've convinced you guys that, that the value of a dollar today to, to each and every one of you is, is gonna be pretty different from the value of that dollar, you know, X years down, down the line. And so discount rate, uh, even though it's, it's kind of like this theoretical concept that we use in, in doing these economic and financing problems is, is like a really real thing that has very strong implications, um, especially if our decision making is driven by economics, right? Uh, like my choice to invest in like a coal plant or a solar facility, like that 
like absent any regulation is really going to be driven by economics. Um, and so discount rates is, is super, super important. Um, okay, so now let's think about this concept in a broader perspective. Uh, Self-interested individuals and companies will prefer money now rather than in the future. Um, so how does that pertain to like a multi-generational problem like, like climate change? Um, let's, let's really extend this idea of like $1,000 today versus $1,000 uh, next year. If, if I were to, to then ask the question $1,000 today versus $1,000 100 years from now, like you, it, it, would, it, it wouldn't matter, right? Like it doesn't matter what uh, for you as an individual, uh, what value that the discount rate would be. It, it would be, uh, you would never, um, under almost any choice of a discount rate, you would you would never sort of really decide to take that money a hundred years from from now because most likely, right, you'll uh, you'll be passed away, and and so the value of that money really is 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 worthless. And so when we think about a problem that spans many decades or even centuries, such as climate change suddenly the issue of discount rates becomes kind of intractable. And so there needs to be some kind of idea of how do I think about discount rates as it applies to society? And how do I think about discount rates over these like intergenerational time periods? Um, and, and so like, even if I, impose like a carbon tax or something and some value on the impact of like me using electricity that that emits that that is coming from a source that emits carbon uh you know if those negative impacts aren't going to happen for 40 50 60 years then uh even when i price in those kind of externalities like my decision making process isn't going to change because the discounting of that of those negative impacts is going to be negligible. So that's why uh, there is this idea of uh, like a social discount rate that is much lower than anything that you would see from a business or an, even an individual. So things like uh, like a zero percent discount rate, um, and that's that is what a lot of folks argue is necessary to um, uh, to address these sort of larger scale problems and, and others will argue you know um, uh, a, a really small discount rate real discount rates of like two percent on the assumption that like future generations are going to be wealthier so so we'll, we won't get into into any of that theory but hopefully you can see now that that this idea of the con of the discount rate is particularly problematic for these long time scales. Um, so, for an individual time preference, uh, we think about uh, consumers making decisions about outcomes and events that occur over time, and we always prefer immediate utility over delayed utility. Uh, when you think about an intergenerational time preference, you are, instead of thinking about utility for yourself, you're thinking about utility for future individuals. Um, and so whatever this, however you think of this like concept applied quantitatively, it, it's really trying to capture, um, capture the idea that you are trying to pass on utility to sort of future generations. Um, okay, and so this time discounting um, includes factors that diminish expected utility generated by a future consequence. So um, 
like one of the things that you do when you do discounting is you think about your sort of possible outcomes and then the rates that you affect or the, the rates that, uh, that come out of that line of thought are gonna be influenced by a slew of, of, of items. And so when we think about these long periods, um, long time periods uh, and, and social discounting, you want to decrease the effect of certain things, of certain uh, calculus, which would increase the, the discount rate. And so examples of that include things like uh, uncertainty, things like changing tastes, uh, things like opportunity costs. We're, we Essentially the way you wanna think about this is like, um, if I can make these things matter less to me, uh, to the formation of the discount rate, then you can end up with something a lot lower where you may feasibly end up uh, really sort of valuing um, decisions that help the future rather than, than today. Um, so opportunity costs, um, and, and sometimes you may even try and increase the value uh, People have people actually have argued about things like negative discount rates, where you care more about the future than you, than you care uh, today, in order to address these these sorts of problems. Um, so, selecting uh, a discount rate um, zero means that the welfare of future generations indefinitely are equal to the problems of today. Uh, and this is a way that we can take precautions against future catastrophic events. Uh, there's a famous um, review paper uh, called the Stern Review, where they sort of demonstrate that uh, you need a 0.1% social discount rate in order to um, in order to fight climate change. Um, and, and that is really kind of a uh, extreme value. Um, when we think about the types of like interest rates and, and real rates that we observe today, you know, one to 2%, uh, you know, on, on US corporate capital, like the average 6.6% 6 per, 6 .6 per year, even um, the IPCC, the inter, um, uh, uh, the panel, <laughs> I'm totally blanking on, on the eye, but the panel for climate change, international uh, panel for, for climate change. Um, so this is a group of uh, international scientists, a uh, huge group of them, hundreds, uh, hundreds of scientists who basically spend several years uh, to put out um, these interim reports uh, that talk about impacts of climate change, uh, mitigation, climate change scenarios, and and um, and that sort of thing. So it's kind of the authority on on thinking about climate change. Um, all of their scenarios, thinking about discounts and uh, discount rates on the order of you know five to twenty six percent. All all their sort of like regular baseline scenarios, and so the, those tend to be um, not so optimistic when when it comes to um, the, the economics of, of, of addressing it. And, and they do actually do some scenarios where there, there are um, uh, real, where, where they actually look at social discount rates that are really low, um, but those, those are not really considered to be in the sort of baseline sets of scenarios. Um, yeah, so going back to the relation to climate change, um, right? So the mitigate, so the benefits that you would do from investing in something like renewables or something like um, uh, like carbon capture and sequestration, you are essentially what you're doing is you are bearing a lot of the mitigation costs for dealing with climate change today, but you don't observe the benefits of the GHG emissions uh, over 
um, until a long, long period of time. Uh, and so again, to kind of maybe help hammer this, this point home, if I were to do my same sort of concept, right, you might have like a really, really, really big cost here in year zero. Uh, so big cost. Um, and then you have in year one, a small benefit, right? Uh, and but but the thing is that that benefit happens over a really long period of time. So maybe this goes out to year two hundred, right? Um, but because these are all getting discounted, uh, then then that value, even summed up over a long period of time, ends up being really small unless you can make the discount rate really small. So that's that's kind of this whole concept here. So now the question becomes, you know, how should governments discount the costs and benefits of public projects, especially projects that affect future generations? Um, so there are actually concrete examples of um, policy that, that helps to deal with these sort of things. And so, um, so France, UK and U US governments have, have actually done recommendations and projects for these systems where you have a discount rate that actually changes over time. And so it decreases in the discount rate decreases in the future so that you still maintain value on, on some of the benefits that you're seeing over really long time scales. Um, and there's some acknowledgement that, uh, that there's uncertainty in the rate of return for a lot of those benefits. Um, yeah, and, and so yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of leave it there. Um, so Ramsey equation, uh, discount rate applied to net future benefits. So this is, this is like a, the sort of one of the oldest um, documented concepts of thinking about discounting and so, um, the way this is explained is, okay, so you have the sum of the utility rate of uh, discount, so your time preference and the rate in, of growth and consumption between whatever time period and the present. And that's weighted by uh, the elasticity of the marginal utility of consumption. So that equation looks um, something like this. Uh, and, and so this is, um, this is the way that we used to, or, or, or this is the way that um, you can generalize uh, a, a discount rate, sort of like an average discount rate for a society is, is, is by, by thinking about this. This is kind of a way of thinking about, for, for, for example, when I elicited an individual discount rate, um, there are you know, particular concerns about how, I would, uh, how you would value that. Uh, and this was an attempt to kind of uh, get 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 that rate for for society, and there's there's a couple of different ways in which um, in which this uh, rate has been um, sort of derived, and so this market rate of return um, from Nordhaus, if you use uh, if you apply it to this. Ramsey equation, you get like a 6% discount rate. Um, and, and that's like, okay, like what is the discount rate on average that I need to make and like socially to make my money back. Um, whereas in the Stern review, I was talking about if you apply the discount rate that we would need to like combat climate change, then you'd end up with a number that's closer to like 1.4%. Um, okay, and so economics of climate change from this Stern review, um, the sort of justification behind this, right? It's, it, it is uh, from the perspective of lo like lots of economists, it, it's, it is a fairly sort of radical idea, um, but essentially climate change is like a really serious threat. Um, and therefore you need to have these more extreme approaches to, to think about, uh, to, to address that issue. Um, 
And so the, the, way, the way in which this rate was formed was actually uh, calculating the sort of negative net productivity um, around the world as a result of climate change. And so this particularly particular study estimates something like uh, you, you're damaging GDP um, by, uh, you, you're essentially losing 20% of your, your uh, GDP, not 20% of, of the total world's GDP, but 20% of the, of the gains um, in, in growth every year. And so that ends up adding up to the very sort of significant amount of, uh, uh, of energy, or, or not energy, of, of, of sort of economic uh, wealth. Um, and so if you reduce greenhouse gas emissions, then you can limit that to 1% from, from 20%. Uh, and so if you kind of go through that math, you can, you can figure out that, you know, the way in which we need to value those negative impacts is, is going to be having that super, super, super low discount rate. And, uh, it is definitely, um, a controversial item, um, lots, there was a lot of sort of negative commentary about, um, from, from economists about that particular analysis and, and study. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, what society chooses as, uh, as like a sort of theoretical or phys philosophical construct of the discount rate is going to determine how we, uh, we as society choose to uh, address climate change and to promote greenhouse gas abatement. Um, yeah, and, and so fundamentally, this this ends up being a very sort of central concept to um, to the way in in, in which uh, we we form long term strategies um, to to mitigate climate change. Um, okay. So that's, this is my last slide for today. So we'll, we'll be ending a little bit early. Um, if anyone uh, has any comments or questions or is confused about this discounting um, concept, uh, I'm, I'm happy to, uh, to help clarify. So um, quick note to remember that the homeworks are due tonight at midnight. So make sure to get it in on time. Um, yeah, there, there's a standard penalty if it's late, it's, it's in the syllabus, um, but hopefully you guys will, will be able to finish it on time. Uh, otherwise, I will see all of you guys on Monday um, and, and next week, it'll, it's, it'll be the same kind of schedule. So homeworks are gonna be assigned Monday after they're due and then you'll have the same amount of time to, to do it. So we'll have our second homework assigned on, on Monday. Um, so we'll end here and I'll stick around for a couple of minutes if anyone has any questions or comments. Thank you.